everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker, and today we have episode 205, uh, February 1st, 2021. And we've got another news show for you. I've, <laughs> there's just so much going on. I, I had to pare this down. I mean, I, even with two new shows in a row, uh, I've had so many things I've wanted to bring up, but I just, ha I just can't. <laughs> I can't do them all. So, But we're still going to cover a lot of stuff today, a lot of really interesting things today. So uh, we're going to talk briefly about how you should be updating all of your iOS devices. Uh, there were some big, nasty bugs found that have been patched, and those bugs have been exploited. So you're going to definitely want to update your iOS devices. Uh, we're going to talk about how Apple's appears to be killing off a Mac OS feature, which I called attention to a few weeks back, or maybe a couple months back at this point, that was pretty troubling. Uh, but it's, so it's good that good to see that they heard the feedback and that they're changing course on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Microsoft and Google tangentially, how they've been adding some new features to their browsers that will check your passwords and accounts against, you know, possible data breaches. And while that's an interesting feature, there's, I think, a little bit a little more behind that. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about some new kind of benign looking, almost selfie worthy <laughs> police robots and why it actually is creepier than that. And of course, we'll have an article from EFF to talk about that one. Got an article about uh, another article, unfortunately, about how intelligence analysts are using uh, smartphone data uh, without warrants. Going to talk a little bit about uh, an interaction with Tim Cook, who's the CEO of Apple, and some comments he recently made about privacy um, directed indirectly, but obviously, at companies like Facebook. We've talked recently about the Apple privacy labels and how Google seems to be dragging its heels on that. I've got a couple articles related to that, uh, explaining what Google is going to be doing and the changes it's going to be making to its tracking, and how some of the privacy labels, uh, while, again, I totally applaud the idea, have been shown to be still misleading or completely inaccurate. But part of that is because they're self-reported, and, you know, once someone draws attention to these, Apple will look into them, so maybe those will get changed. So lots to talk about today. Uh, before we get into the news real quick, I got a couple more reviews that were really nice I wanted to pass on. Um, first of all, so <laughs> I've been looking for reviews on the fourth edition of the book, and I, for some reason, just happened to look back at the at the third edition, and I, I realized that the number of reviews for the third edition of the book is still increasing, which means a couple things. First, that the third edition is still available for, for purchase, which that is out of my control. My publisher handles that, and I really kind of wish they'd pull it from the shelves, but uh, it's still there. Hopefully, whenever you look up the title, it should bring you to the new one. Or even if you look at the old one, it should say, hey, there's a newer version of this. But for whatever reason, or maybe people just bought the third edition and they're just now getting around to posting reviews. I don't know, because I have been asking for them. So anyway, this was a review on the third edition that I really wish I could carry forward to the fourth edition. <laughs> but let me read real quick. It's from Seth B. Five out of five stars. And it says the title is absolutely the best practical Internet security book I've read. And it says, you've probably heard a great deal in the past few years about malware, data breaches, data corruption, and internet security. You've probably also heard about solutions being offered like VPN, changing DNS settings, malware cleaners, and the like. Many of you probably are wondering, what do I download from my computer to make sure my data is backed up, my computer is malware-free, I can safely browse the internet, and I can do everything I can to ensure that big tech doesn't track me. If this describes you, buy this book. I consider myself a cybersecurity aficionado, and I've learned a ton from this book. He shows you what issues you should be concerned about, privacy, security, data backups, etc., what software and hardware is best for this, how to download it, and how to install it. Once you're done working through this book, you will have ironclad defenses against malicious actors. If you follow his advice, your data will be backed up and encrypted both locally and on the cloud. You'll be using a VPN and the best DNS settings to make sure you aren't being tracked. And big tech will now have a very minimal handle on your data and much more. Thank you, Seth. That was a wonderful review. I hope somehow you managed to get the fourth edition of the book. I apologize if for some reason Amazon pushed you toward the third one, even though the fourth one's been out since September. If you like the third one, you'll love the fourth. And then I noticed also while I was on Amazon that uh, because my podcast is available through more than just iTunes, I happened to notice there was a podcast review on Amazon. Uh, and this is from Adam and five out of five stars and just says quickly, thank you for being our dragon slayer. I've been listening to Carrie Parker now for a little over a year after dealing with my credit card information being stolen online. There is no one more dedicated and knowledgeable to help you through making your digital life more private and secure. You also do not have to be a tech wizard as Carrie Parker puts everything into amazing bite-sized steps to making your online presence more private and secure. Thank you, Adam. And thanks to all of you who have posted reviews. I read them all, uh, and I will read all the new ones on the air. 
and they really, really do make a big difference. They make a huge difference. So uh, if you have a chance, if you've read the book, please post a nice review on Amazon. Uh, and the, for the podcast, you're obviously listening to the podcast now. Um, I, I guess there's some trouble doing this. I'm not sure why it's so difficult. You might have to go to the iTunes webpage for my podcast in order to leave a review. You'll probably have to be logged in to do it. Uh, but apparently you can do it on other places too. You can leave it on Amazon and probably Spotify and others. I'll have to, I guess I'll have to go and check and find some reviews on other ones as well. But obviously do it wherever it's most convenient for you. But um, the one that probably has the most impact will be iTunes. Most people do get their stuff from the I iTunes podcast page or app. So if you have a choice, I would prefer that. But, you know, obviously do it, do it wherever you can. I very much appreciate it regardless. And now let's get to this week's news. <laughs> All right, first up, as I said, there's really not much more to say about this, but there's uh, some really nasty bugs found in iOS that apparently were being actively exploited. So, again, all software has bugs, and it really comes down to how quickly the companies that own those bugs get them fixed. And Apple, to its credit, is pretty good about that. So make sure you, your iPhones and your iPads are completely up to date. Look for those updates. Even if you have auto updates turned on, sometimes it does take a, I don't know, day or two for them to apply, I would go make sure right now, go into settings and go into general, and then look at software update. And if you go to that thing, it'll automatically look for an update. And if there is one to be had, it will offer to install it. And I would go ahead and do that right away. So just as an aside, uh, if you were following me on Facebook or Twitter, you would have already seen a warning about this from me. And honestly, I would say Facebook, <laughs> I, hate, I, almost hate, I hate to utter these words. Facebook is probably the better place to find me because if you follow me there, I think you'll see everything I post. Whereas on Twitter, it seems to kind of pick and choose what it shows. So if you, even if you follow me on Twitter, I'm not sure you would see every one of my posts. But anyway, uh, if you're following me there, that, that's a, that's the, honestly, that's the best place to make sure that you're going to get timely information from me. While I definitely will cover it here, whether it's an interview or a new show or not, if it's important enough, I'll cover it on the show every week. But some of these things, like this one in particular, I would say is important enough that you would want to know right away. So another reason to follow me on Facebook or Twitter. Now, a couple of months ago, I talked about this new feature that was coming in Mac OS. Well, features may be a strong word, but a new change to the way it was handling the internal software firewall. And without getting terribly technical, the firewall software, I mean, the operating system itself, has control over where your little data packets go where they're allowed to go, where they're allowed to come from. That's all part of the firewall function. And Apple apparently, for some reason, exempted some of its applications from this control, meaning that third-party firewall applications and VPNs were not allowed to alter the routing or block the routing of these connections from Apple apps. Anyway, so let me read a little bit of, a, of an article here from ThreatPost, and it will explain it some more. Apple has removed a contentious macOS feature that allowed some Apple apps to bypass content filters, VPNs, and third-party firewalls. This feature, first uncovered in November in a beta release of the macOS Big Sur feature, was called Content Filter Exclusion List and included a list of at least 50 Apple apps, including Maps, Music, FaceTime, the App Store, and its software update service. It has been recently removed in macOS Big Sur version 11.2, Apple experts pointed out this week. Patrick Wardle, who we've had on the show before, he runs a great website called Objective C, S E E, uh, with some great tools, by the way. Uh, so if you haven't been to that site and you're a Mac person, you should definitely check that out. Patrick Wardle, principal security researcher for JamF, said, and I quote, after lots of bad press and lots of feedback bug reports to Apple from developers such as myself, it seems wiser, more security-conscious minds at Cupertino prevailed. The content filter exclusion list has been removed in macOS 11.2 Beta 2, unquote. So what that means is these, are, these beta builds are, of the software are uh, pre-release versions of software that you will eventually be getting on your Mac, but they, they go through this process where they release beta versions of this to special developers and other people who get to vet it ahead of time. So by the time it comes out for everybody, it's hopefully all the, you know, all the glitches and bugs have been found uh, and it's ready for prime time. Anyway, so that basically means that these people who are ahead of the curve and looking at these beta products get a preview of what's coming. And apparently this is coming in 11.2 and it's a welcome change. Now back to the article. And there's some technical stuff here. Don't worry too much about it. Um, some of these terms. You'll, you'll get the general gist. Researchers found that these apps were excluded from being controlled by Apple's NE Filter Data Provider feature. NE Filter Data Provider is a simple network content filter which is used by third-party application firewalls and VPNs to filter data traffic flow on an app-by-app -app basis. 
Because these apps bypassed any filtered data provider, the service could not monitor them to see how much data they were transferring or which IP addresses they were communicating with, and ultimately could not block them if something was amiss. After discovering the undocumented exclusion list back in November, security researchers criticized Apple, criticized Apple saying it was a liability that could be exploited by threat actors to bypass firewalls, give them access to people's systems, and expose their sensitive data. And again, a quote from Patrick Wardle, he says, quote, Many rightfully asked, what good is a firewall if I can't block all traffic? I, of course, also wondered if malware could abuse these excluded items to generate network traffic that could surreptitiously bypass any socket filter firewall. Unfortunately, the answer was yes, unquote. The new change means that firewalls can now comprehensively filter and block network traffic for all Apple apps. And the article called out a, a couple of these firewalls in particular that if you're curious, you could take a look at. One of them is called Little Snitch, uh, and the other one, uh, written by Patrick Wardle, which is totally free and open source, is called Lulu. And basically what these things do is they kind of run in the background, and they warn you when some new application that you have on your machine is trying to phone home or who knows where. Basically, anytime there's an outbound connection that it doesn't recognize something new that you haven't already approved, it pops up a warning and says, hey, this thing is trying to talk to somebody out there. Do you want to let this happen or not? And you can allow or block it or you can temporarily, temporarily allow or block it. And I will say that it's kind of technical. Like when it pops up and shows you what it is, it's not always obvious what it is. So a lot of times you have to look that thing up on the internet and figure out what that thing is and decide whether or not it's something you want to block or not. But anyway, it, it's still interesting to kind of see because, you know, you've got applications running on your machine that you don't know about. They're all running in the background. A lot of things you install, install little helper apps that run in the background, like, you know, maybe to check for software updates. There's an Adobe one that I just actually recently blocked that constantly runs to make sure that you've got a valid license for their Adobe products. <laughs> I blocked it just because it annoys me. But if you're interested, definitely go to, if you're a Mac person, definitely go to Objective C. That's objective seecom And Patrick Wardle's got some really cool tools there. All right, moving on. So, Microsoft Edge, which is, uh, they redid and then re redid their browser for Windows 10. And their Edge browser, well, it was a custom Microsoft thing, but now it is based on Chromium, which is the underlying engine behind the Chrome, the Google Chrome browser and several other browsers. And, you know, like Chrome and some other browsers, they're adding new features to try to get you to use them. And this latest one is a password monitoring system um, that purports to be looking at the passwords that you've saved in the browser to see if those passwords have shown up in data breaches somewhere. So let me read a, just a snippet from this article. I don't want to get into too many details about it, but I, I do want to kind of bring it up and bring up an important point that I think uh, is worth making about these. So it says, from ZDNet, the stable version of Microsoft Edge version 88 gained the password monitor feature, which Microsoft announced in March 2020. Not to be confused with a password manager, this is Microsoft's alert for passwords that have been exposed in data breaches and leaked online. Google added a feature to Chrome in 2019, and Mozilla started testing its password breach alert service in 2018, which is to say that the Chrome browser and the Firefox browser have similar features. Browser makers have been keen to get us to sign in, but how do you get users to sign into a browser when there's no perceived value beyond syncing browsers across desktop and mobile? Security, or more specifically, a security service that alerts the users to a password that's been leaked online could be a key benefit here. Like other browser-based password breach notification services, Microsoft Password Monitor alerts edge users of any of their passwords saved in the browser's password manager match a password exposed in a data breach. And this is a quote from the Microsoft PR folks. It says, quote, when you turn on password monitor, Microsoft Edge ch checks the passwords you've saved in the browser against a larger database of known leaked passwords that are stored in the cloud. If any of your passwords match those in the database, they'll appear on the password monitor page in the Microsoft Edge settings. Any passwords listed there are no longer safe to use and you should change them immediately. Make sure you've signed in to Microsoft Edge using your Microsoft account or your work or your school account, unquote. All right, so let me take this apart in two different ways. First of all, the the obvious part, and password monitoring is, is cool. It's a great feature. And what these services are doing, and by the way, LastPass has this as well, is these data breaches, you know, somebody downloads a massive password database from somewhere uh, and posts it on the dark web for sale. And because it's out there and it's for sale, security researchers and the like have been able to get a hold of these things as well. 
and poke into them. And the, these password databases, the way they work, your passwords are not stored as clear text. We've talked about this before, but just quickly again, when you type in your password, whatever it is, it's not like, let's say you're logging into Google and you type in your Google password, that password, the, what you just typed is not actually saved somewhere on Google servers in clear text. That would be kind of dumb, right? If, because if somebody gets that password database, they've got everybody's passwords. So what they do is they use what's called a cryptographic hashing function. And I know that sounds very technical and honestly, under the covers, it's extremely technical, but the simple version of it is when you hash something, anything, doesn't matter how big or how big it is. If you shove a whole bunch of text into this function, it'll pop out a unique long number essentially. And so what happens is, is you put in your password and your password is hashed. So it's converted in a one way function from whatever it is you typed your password to this really long number. And what they store is the number and the way these hashing, fun hashing functions works, it's you're guaranteed that if you put something in, you'll get the same output every time, but it's almost impossible as in mathematically, logistically, computationally impossible to reverse that process. Given the hash, it's really, really, really hard. So hard that it's basically impossible to turn around and get the password that created that hash. So what they do is they store the hash of your password. So when you enter your password, it's hashed and that hash is what is sent to the server. And the server checks the hash that came from the password you just entered to the hash that was there when you first signed up. And if those hashes match, then the passwords must match. Now, there's a lot more technical stuff behind that that I'm not going to get into, but that's, that's how that works. So you might be thinking, okay, well, that's, that's a great idea. So if someone steals the password database and that password database is just full of a bunch of hashes and those hashes can't be reversed, then what's the problem? Well, here's the problem. First, the real problem is that humans are horrible at creating passwords on their own. So if your password is password, like P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D, or maybe you got super clever and you made a zero for the O, or maybe you went that extra step and said password one, two, three, those are, those passwords are horrible. And they're so bad that the bad guys take these lists of known bad passwords and they have tens of thousands of them. Plus they take the English dictionary or whatever dictionary for the country you happen to be in. And they pre-calculate the hashes for all of those passwords and simple combinations of those passwords. So that when they see a hash and a password database, if it matches one of the ones they have for one of the really horrible, very guessable passwords, then they know what your password is. So what these things are doing, they're doing two things. They're a, they're looking for your email address because most people's accounts are signed up by email address and password. So if they find your email address and a password data breach somewhere, then they alert you to say, Hey, this email address was associated with a breach somewhere. In fact, it was associated with a breach at name your place, Home Depot. And so that might prompt you to go to Home Depot and change your password. But what it also can do is look, is take the passwords that are in your password manager and take the hashes of those passwords and see if those hashes exist in the database as well. And then they would know that your password is in there. Now they don't know that your password was cracked. In other words, they don't know that they were, the bad guys will be able to take that hash and reverse it to get your actual password. But the fact that it exists there means that you might want to change it. So that's part one, part two of this. And it's really the, the key here. And that is Microsoft and Google want you to sign in to your web browser. That would be Microsoft edge and Google Chrome respectively. Why? Because when you sign in, you are basically giving them permission. I'm sure if you look in the terms of service for them to track more data on you. And I would just, honestly, I would just assume that if you're using Microsoft edge or Google Chrome, whether you signed in or not, I would assume that they are still milking your data for all it's worth. Certainly all they can within the current laws of the land, which in the U.S. unfortunately are pretty, pretty poor. So it's a great feature. I like the idea. I still would not use Microsoft Edge's browser or Google Chrome. I would use Firefox and use LastPass or 1Password or Bitwarden as your password manager. And I'd pretty sure if they don't have these features already, they, they will. I know that LastPass has these features. I think it's a for pay feature. So this one is not part of the free program, but it's like, I don't know, 12 bucks a year or something cheap. It's, it's totally worth it. So anyway, uh, great idea, but I wouldn't use your browser's password manager. In fact, to stop it from asking you constantly, Hey, would you like to save this password? When you already have LastPass or something else, you'll need to go into settings and say, stop asking.
which somewhere there's a setting that says don't save my passwords. And if it has already saved your passwords, I would probably just delete them. Make sure you transfer them to your to LastPass first. But while they have definitely gotten better, password managers within browsers are, I would say, are generally not nearly as secure as the dedicated ones like LastPass, 1Password, Bitwarden, etc. In fact, in the old days, these quote-unquote password managers stored your passwords in plain text, which is horrible. So anyway, don't use those browsers and don't use your browser's password manager. The one possible exception might be Safari. Uh, it's built into the whole Apple ecosystem to use their keychain password vault, which if you're already all up in there and use it uh, and you're strictly a Mac person, that may be good enough. I still prefer LastPass. All right, that's enough of that. Moving on. So this is an article from the EFF about police robots. And (laughs) without explaining any further, let me just read the article. The arrival of government-operated autonomous police robots does not look like predictions in science fiction movies. An army of robots with gun arms is not kicking down your door to arrest you. Instead, a robot snitch that looks like a rolling trash can is programmed to decide whether a person looks suspicious and then call the human police on them. Police robots may not be able to hurt people like armed predator drones used in combat, yet, but as history shows, calling the police on someone can prove equally deadly. Long before the 1987 movie RoboCop, even before Carol Capick invented the term robot in 1920, police have been trying to find ways to be everywhere at once. Widespread security cameras are one solution, but even a blanket of CCTV cameras couldn't follow a subject into every nook of a public space. Thus, the vision of a police robot continued as a dream until now. Whether they look like the Boston Dynamics Robo Dogs or Nightscope's Rolling Pickles, Robots are coming to a street, shopping mall, or grocery store near you. Now, I'll stop there for a second. If you haven't looked up Boston Dynamics robots, just do a web search for it. These things are at once amazing and terrifying. <laughs> These robots that they've come up with that do just crazy stuff. Uh, just trust me. Go go uh, do some web searching for Boston Dynamics robots and look at some of the videos. It's it's amazing. Uh, and then Nightscope is the one we're talking about in this article. And, and of course, it's an audio podcast, so you can't see the picture. But it's basically, they call them rolling pickles. I'm not sure if I'd call it that. It looks like a looks like a spaceship, honestly, like a six-foot-tall conical robot on wheels with cameras and sensors. So with that mental image, let me continue the article. The Orwellian menace of snitch robots might not be immediately apparent. Robots are fun. They dance. You can take selfies with them. This is by design. Both police departments and the companies that sell these robots know that their greatest contributions aren't just surveillance, but also goodwill. In one brochure Nightscope sent to University of California Hastings, a law school in the center of San Francisco, the company advertises their robot's activity in Los Angeles' shopping district called The Block. It's unclear if the robot stopped any robberies, but it did garner over 100,000 social media impressions and 426 comments. Nightscope claims the robot's 193 million overall media impressions was worth over $5.8 million. The block held a naming contest for the robot and said it has a quote-unquote cool factor missing from traditional beat cops and security guards. As of February 2020, Nightscope had around 100 robots deployed 24-7 throughout the United States. And how many of these communities did neighbors or community members get a say as to whether or not they approved of the deployment of these robots? But in this era of long overdue conversations about the role of policing in our society, and in which city after city is reclaiming privacy by restricting police surveillance technologies, these robots are just a more playful way to normalize the panopticon of our lives. Nightscope's robots need cameras to navigate and traverse the terrain, but that's not all their sensors are doing. According to the proposal that the Police Department of Huntington Park, California, sent to the mayor and city council, these robots are equipped with many infrared cameras capable of reading license plates. They also have wireless technology, quote, capable of identifying smartphones within its range down to Mac and IP addresses, unquote. The next time you're at a protest and are relieved to see a robot rather than a baton-wielding officer, know that that robot may be using the IP address of your phone to identify your participation. This makes protesters vulnerable to reprisal from police and thus chills future exercise of constitutional rights. And here's a quote from uh, uh, Nightscope's blog. It says, quote, When a device emitting a Wi-Fi signal passes within a nearly 500-foot radius of a robot, actionable intelligence is captured from that device, including information such as where, when, distance between the robot and the device, the duration the device was in the area, and how many other times it was detected on the site recently, unquote. 
In spring 2019, the company also announced it was developing face recognition so that robots will be able to, quote, detect, analyze, and compare faces, end quote. EFF has long proposed a complete ban on police use of facial recognition technology. Nightscope's marketing materials and media reporting suggest the technology can effectively recognize, quote-unquote, suspicious packages, vehicles, and people. When a robot is scanning a crowd for someone or something suspicious, what is it actually looking for? It's unclear what the company means. The decision to characterize certain actions and attributes as, quote-unquote, suspicious has to be made by someone. If robots are designed to think people wearing hoods are suspicious, they may target youth of color. If robots are programmed to zero in on people moving quickly, they may harass a jogger or a pedestrian on a rainy day. If the machine has purportedly been taught to identify criminals by looking at pictures of mugshots, then you have an even bigger problem. Racism in the criminal justice system has all but assured that any machine learning program taught to see quote-unquote criminals based on crime data will inevitably see people of color as suspicious. A robot's machine learning and so-called suspicious behavior detection will lead to racial profiling and other unfounded harassment. This begs the question, who gets reprimanded if a robot improperly harasses an innocent person or calls the police on them? Does the robot? The people who train or maintain the robot? When state violence is unleashed on a person because a robot falsely flagged them as suspicious, quote, changing the programming, unquote, of the robot and then sending it back onto the street will be little solace for a victim hoping that it won't happen again. And when programming errors cause harm, who will review the changes to make sure they can address the real problem? These are all important questions to ask yourselves and your police and elected officials before taking a selfie with a rolling surveillance robot. Okay, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I think that I think they made it pretty clear. Surveillance in any form, no matter how cool it looks or selfie-worthy it looks, is still surveillance. And anytime we try to automate that surveillance, we're asking for trouble. All right, let's move on. Uh, this is a story I mentioned last week that uh, it's just too interesting not to read. And this 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 version of the article is from CNN, actually, which I don't often read from. Uh, but it's titled, Microsoft patented a chatbot that would let you talk to dead people. It was too disturbing for production. And I'll just read the article and then we'll talk about it. The internet is buzzing over a new technology created by Microsoft developers that would make it possible to have a virtual conversation with a deceased loved one. Well, kind of. A patent granted to Microsoft last month details a method for creating a conversational chatbot modeled after a specific person. A, quote, past or present entity, such as a friend, a relative, an acquaintance, a celebrity, a fictional character, a historical figure, unquote, according to the filing with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Want to talk music with David Bowie or get some words of wisdom from your late grandmother? This tool would theoretically make that possible, but don't get too excited or freaked out for that matter. The company isn't planning to turn the technology into an actual product. Famous last words. Tim O'Brien, Microsoft General Manager of AI Programs, said in a tweet on Friday that he, quote, confirmed that there's no plan for this, unquote. In a separate tweet, he also echoed the sentiment of other Internet users commenting on the technology, saying, quote, yes, it's disturbing, unquote. Here's how the technology would work if it were, in fact, built into a product. According to patent information, the tool would call social data, such as images, social media posts, messages, voice data, and written letters from the chosen individual. That data would be used to train a chatbot to, quote, converse or interact in the personality of the specific person, unquote. It could also rely on outside data sources in case the user asked a question of the bot that couldn't be answered based on the person's social data. And here's a quote from the patent. It says, quote, conversing in the personality of a specific person may include determining and or using conversational attributes of the specific person, such as style, diction, tone, voice, intent, sentence or dialogue length and complexity, topic and consistency, unquote, as well as using behavioral attributes such as interests and opinions and demographic information such as age, gender and profession, the patent states. In some cases, the tool could even be used to apply voice and facial recognition algorithms to recordings, images, and videos to create a voice and a 2D or 3D model of the person to enhance the chatbot. While Microsoft doesn't have plans to create a product for the technology, the patent does indicate that the possibilities for artificial intelligence have moved beyond creating fake people to creating virtual models of real people. So, yeah, that's kind of creepy. Uh, I mean... I'm a technologist. I'm a software engineer. It's also got a cool factor, I've got to admit. And the thing that that I keep thinking, you know, we've done, we've already done this in movies. We've brought dead actors back to life. 
to play in movies after their death. Star Wars did this a couple times. I think they did this in the uh, the updated Blade Runner movie, the sequel. And I, boy, I wish I had the uh, the article handy handy for this, but I know that somewhere back when I read articles talking about how very popular actors, and I would have to guess musical artists as well, are coming up with things in their contract, basically <laughs> copywriting or trademarking, whatever the proper legal term is, their likeness, their digital likeness, their, the, the way they move, like in, in such a way, basically the point is whether or not they will be able to license themselves in digital AI form of some form or another after they're dead. You know, so that maybe in the future, these actors could appear in movies virtually. I mean, think about it. There's there's tons and tons of footage of these people already, how they move, what they look like at different ages, what they sound like, all their mannerisms. Not just, I mean, think about all the movies these people have been in, all the videos and interviews they've been in, but all the stuff that was on the cutting room floor. I mean, there, there's... Just tons and tons of footage. And that's what these AI algorithms need as input to generate their output. So, you know, if you feed in enough of this stuff with the proper technology, it, it, it's coming. I mean, a lot of it's already here, but it's getting better all the time. We will be able to potentially see movies of people after they're dead doing new stuff. It's crazy. What a world we live in. All right, moving on. What we have next is yet another story and, and several stories like it. Um, I've, uh, I've covered these before, but it's it, it's a new one and it's worth keeping this at the top of your mind. Uh, this is from the New York Times and it's about how uh, yet another government agency has been caught. Uh, maybe that's a strong word because it's probably not currently illegal to do so. Using location data on U.S. citizens that it bought from a third party data broker. So let me read this article. It says... A military arm of the intelligence community buys commercially available databases containing location data from smartphone apps and searches it for Americans' past movement without a warrant, according to an unclassified memo obtained by the New York Times. Defense intelligence agency analysts have searched for the movements of Americans within a commercial database in five investigations over the past two and a half years, agency officials disclosed in a memo they wrote for Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat of Oregon. The disclosure sheds light on an emerging loophole in privacy law during the digital age. In a landmark 2018 ruling known as the Carpenter decision, the Supreme Court held that the Constitution requires the government to obtain a warrant to compel phone companies to turn over location data about their customers. And just a quick side note, that was argued by Nate Wessler from the ACLU, who won that case, by the way, and we had on the show. If you go back all the way back to episode 61, back in April of 2018. Anyway. But the government can instead buy similar data from a broker and does not believe it needs a warrant to do so. A quote from this memo, agency memo, it says, quote, DIA does not construe the Carpenter decision to require a judicial warrant endorsing purchase or use of commercially available data for intelligence purposes, unquote. Mr. Wyden has made clear that he intends to propose legislation to add safeguards for Americans' privacy in connection with commercially available location data. In a Senate speech this week, he denounced circumstances, quote, in which the government, instead of getting an order, just goes out and purchases the private records of Americans from these sleazy and unregulated commercial data brokers who are simply above the law, unquote. He called the practice unacceptable and an intrusion on constitutional privacy rights. Quote, the Fourth Amendment is not for sale, unquote. The government's use of commercial databases of location information has come under increasing scrutiny. Many smartphone apps log their users' location, and the, and the app makers can aggregate the data and sell it to brokers, who can then resell it, including to the government. It has been known that the government sometimes uses such data for law enforcement purposes on domestic soil. The Wall Street Journal reported last year about law enforcement agencies using such data. In particular, it found two agencies in the Department of Homeland Security, Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Customs and Border Patrol, have used the data in patrolling the border and investigating immigrants who, have, who were later arrested. In October, BuzzFeed reported on the existence of a legal memo from the Department of Homeland Security opining that it was lawful for law enforcement agencies to buy and use smartphone location data without a warrant. The department's inspector general has opened an internal review. The Defense Intelligence Agency appears to be mainly buying and using location data for investigations about foreigners abroad. One of its main missions is detecting threats to American forces stationed around the world. But, the memo said, the unidentified broker or brokers from which the government buys bulk smartphone location data does not separate American and foreign users. 
the Defense Intelligence Agency instead processes the data as it arrives to filter those records which appear to be on domestic soil and puts them in a separate database. Agency analysts may only query that separate database of Americans' data if they receive special approval, the memo said, adding, quote, permissions to query the U.S. device location data has been granted five times in the past two and a half years for authorized purposes, unquote. Which sounds like a reference to something I mentioned at the top of this article. So anyway, there's a couple things here. First of all, the obvious one is that we do, in the United States, have a Fourth Amendment against unreasonable search and seizure, which... You know, at the end of the day means that in order to go through your stuff, they need to go to a court somewhere, give probable cause, uh, and convince a judge that they are likely to find incriminating evidence there and then get a warrant. But, and this brings up the second point, (laughs) the problem here is we are now in an age of surveillance capitalism because so much of the internet that is quote unquote free is only free because our data is being mined and sold and traded constantly, honestly, mostly without our knowledge, even though they claim that we have notice and consent, we really don't. And because all of this data is being collected and sold, it gives the opportunity to these government and law enforcement and intelligence agencies to go and buy this stuff directly without having to get a warrant because it was, (laughs) they didn't collect it, someone else did. And because someone else collected it, they can bypass the fourth amendment. Okay. Lots more to get to. Let's keep going. This is an article from Inc.com, and it's got a, you know, clickbait title. Uh, it says, Tim Cook may have just ended Facebook. That, that's not true. <laughs> but uh, there's some good stuff in this article. Let me read this real quick. In a recent speech at Brussels International Data Privacy Day, Apple CEO Tim Cook went on the offensive against Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Cook's speech seems to be a direct response to Facebook's recent attack on Apple, in which the world's largest social network took out full-page ads in several newspapers attacking Apple's new privacy changes. But what's most fascinating is that Cook took direct aim at Facebook without ever mentioning the company by name. Just check out the following excerpt. And this is uh, uh, apparently a quote from his speech, which I listened to, by the way, in its entirety. You can find the video online. It's, it's well worth watching. Here's the clip quote. It says, Technology does not need vast troves of personal data stitched together across dozens of websites and apps in order to, be, in order to succeed. Advertising existed and thrived for decades without it. And we're here today because the path of least resistance is rarely the path of wisdom. If a business is built on misleading users, on data exploitation, on choices that are no choices at all, then it does not deserve our praise. It deserves reform. We should not look away from the bigger picture, and a moment of rampant disinformation and conspiracy theory is juiced by algorithms. We can no longer turn a blind eye to a theory of technology that says all engagement is good engagement, the longer the better, and all with the goal of collecting as much data as possible. Too many are still asking the question, how much can we get away with, when they need to be asking, what are the consequences? What are the consequences of prioritizing conspiracy theories and violent incitement simply because of the high rates of engagement? What are the consequences of not just tolerating but rewarding content that undermines public trust in life-saving vaccinations? What are the consequences of seeing thousands of users joining extremist groups and then perpetuating an algorithm that recommends even more? It is long past time to stop pretending that this approach doesn't come with a cause. A polarization of lost trust and, yes, of violence. A social dilemma cannot be allowed to become a social catastrophe. I'll just stop there for a second. That's an obvious reference to the social dilemma documentary on Netflix, which I highly recommend. Back to the article. The fact that Tim Cook doesn't name Facebook somehow increases its impact. Because as you hear Cook's speech, you can't help but immediately think of the house that Zuckerberg built. The problem is that Apple's and Facebook's business philosophies are diametrically opposed to each other. Apple is a lifestyle brand, and part of the lifestyle Apple sells is users having more control over their privacy. Facebook, on the other hand, is in the data business. The more data they collect on users, the more effectively they can sell targeted ads. But collecting and selling all that data comes at great cost, as Cook highlights. Quote, The end result of all of this is that you are no longer the customer. You are the product, unquote. Cook went on to further highlight the differences in Apple's and Facebook's philosophies in no uncertain terms. Quote, We believe that ethical technology is technology that works for you. It's technology that helps you sleep, not keeps you up. It tells you when you've had enough. It gives you space to create or draw or learn or write, not refresh just one more time, 
At first glimpse, it might appear that Apple and Facebook are on diverging paths, but in reality, they're on a collision course. Okay, and there's there's more in this article, and that's kind of inflammatory, but I completely agree with the sentiment and certainly agree with what Tim's been saying. I'm not naive enough to believe that if, you know, situations were reversed, that Apple might not be data mining you as well. But it, as it turns out, Apple sells hardware. They sell cool products. They happen to write some great software that goes with that. And they have decided, even though they could have done otherwise, that they don't need your data. Now, there's a lot of other companies that charge you money and still mine your data. They double dip. Like, look at your cell phone company. They charge us ridiculous amounts of money, at least in the United States, for our service, for our cell phone service. It's a lot cheaper elsewhere, by the way. We're really getting raw into the deal here in the United States. But they also track your data. They are your internet service provider when you're not using Wi-Fi. And they are tracking everything you do and reselling that data. But Apple has decided that this is a selling point for them. This is a differentiator for them. They have made privacy a top priority. And I, and I don't doubt that a lot of that is sincere coming from Tim Cook. But I guess my point is, it's not just altruistic, it's actually also makes sense for them as a business model, which a lot of jaded people, perhaps like myself, would find more comforting, that, that their business model is actually leaning towards privacy and not data collection. All right, so next up is a kind of a related article, and this is from Mac Rumors, and it's quoting an article from Jeffrey Fowler in the Washington Post, who I have reached out to again to see if we could get to him to talk about. I'd love to have bring him on the show to talk about this directly. Uh, but knowing how busy he is, let me just read, let me read the summary of the article because it's important to talk about too. So again, this is from Mac Rumors and it's quoting Washington Post. It says, Last month, Apple introduced privacy labels on the App Store, providing users with a broad overview of the data types an app may collect and whether the information is used to track them or is linked to their identity on the device. Apple has required developers to provide this privacy information when submitting new apps and app updates to the App Store since early December. But the labels function on an honor system, with fine print indicating that, quote, this information has not been verified by Apple, unquote. As such, there's always the potential that some apps will be dishonest. On that note, the Washington Post's Jeffrey Fowler recently did a spot check and discovered, quote, more than a dozen apps with either misleading or flat-out inaccurate, unquote, privacy labels. One of these apps was a game called Satisfying Slime Simulator, which Fowler said was sending his iPhone's advertising identifier and other device information to companies like Facebook, Google, and Unity, despite its privacy label indicating no data collected. Fowler listed several other apps with no data collected labels that he found to be covertly collecting user data, such as Rumble, Maps.me, and Fundu Pro. He also found the popular game Match 3D to be, quote, sending an ID for my phone that could be used to track me to more than a dozen different companies, unquote, despite having a label that claimed it only took, quote, data not linked to you, unquote. Match 3D has since updated its label to reflect, quote, data used to track you, unquote. In response to the report, Apple said that it, quote, conducts routine and ongoing audits of the information provided, unquote, and works with developers to correct any inaccuracy, adding that, quote, apps that fail to disclose privacy information accurately may have future app updates rejected or in some cases be removed from the App Store entirely if they don't come into compliance, unquote. This issue will be partially addressed by Apple's upcoming enforcement of a privacy measure it calls App Tracking Transparency, or ATT. Starting with the next betas of iOS 14, iPadOS 14, and tvOS 14, developers will be required to get a user's permission to track their activity across other apps and websites and access their device's random advertising identifier, known as the Identifier for Advertisers, or IDFA, for targeted advertising and ad measurement purposes. Apple said, at the software level, app tracking transparency will prevent developers from accessing a user's IDFA unless they grant permission, preventing an app from silently tracking their activity in this manner. However, there are still other ways for apps to track users, so the accuracy of privacy labels will still not be guaranteed. So we've talked about this already a few times before because it's such a big deal. Facebook took out those big full-page ads in several newspapers complaining that they're going to be hurting small businesses and yada, yada, yada. But the point that Tim Cook made before and the previous one is 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 the one I keep making and that is we had we've had advertising for centuries ever since we could print something we've had ads ever since we could make a sign we've had ads but until recent human history you were watching the ads but the ads weren't watching you that is where things have changed and companies like Facebook and Google who are advertising companies 
I've put the stake in the ground that behavioral ads, as they like to be called, which basically means ads that <laughs> are targeted to you based on your past behaviors, in other words, after tracking and storing tons of data on you, are more valuable than ads that are just contextual, which is the way ads have been prior to that. In other words, you know, if you want to target, you know, middle-aged men, you put ads in an ESPN magazine or on a football game. If you want to tar target housewives, you put them in Cosmopolitan or Good Housekeeping or whatever. Those are contextual ads. They don't know anything about you, but they know the kinds of people that read their magazine or watch their TV show or whatever after doing some studies and getting some generic demographic data. And then based on that, they go to companies with marketing pitches saying, hey, if you want to reach this demographic, I've got a show for you. Anyway, let, let me move on to this next article because it's actually similar. And this is from a uh, BGR.com. And this is related to an article uh, I read you last week about how Google appears to be dragging its feet in, you know, complying with Apple's new privacy labels. Uh, and this addresses that to some degree. And then also addresses the previous thing I'm talking about with this ad tracking transparency feature that's going to be coming up to be enforced in iOS. All I keep hearing is soon. Uh, it sounds like maybe March or April. Apple's continued effort to improve user privacy on iPhone, iPad, and Mac infuriate the companies making money for the ability to sell advertisements you're most likely to click. The only way to sell those lucrative ads is to track you online, and that's par for the course when it comes to internet business. You trade some of your privacy for free products. But Apple is making it harder. Facebook's attack following the rollout of the iOS app privacy labels proves how annoyed the social network is with Apple's move. The privacy labels will not prevent Facebook from collecting ads and I think they mean collecting information. It will just show the user how much personal data apps grab, and you have to go to a specific place to find that information. Facebook ultimately had to comply or risk having its apps removed. Google, on the other hand, wasn't as vociferous as Facebook, even though Google collects plenty of user data. When reports came out saying that Google chooses not to update its apps in December to avoid sticking that privacy label on them, we learned that it's common practice for Google to freeze updates in the busy December month. Those updates were coming, reports said. Fast forward to late January, and Google confirmed that the app privacy labels are indeed coming soon. But the company also told users, in not so many words, that, they're re that it really hates the idea of asking you for permission to be tracked in various apps. So it'll stop using the tracking tool that would force it to ask for permission. Google might not be taking full-page ads in print media telling people how Apple will ruin small business and the Internet as Facebook did, but it's still putting its customers first. In a blog post titled, Preparing Your Partners for Apple's iOS 14 Policy Updates, Google addresses Apple's new App Tracking Transparency, or ATT, that will soon appear in ads and explain how it will impact advertisers. ATT is an iOS privacy feature that's different from the privacy labels. ATT, quote, will require developers to ask for permission when they use certain information from other companies' apps and websites for advertising purposes, even if they already have user consent, unquote. That was a quote from Google. The company says that ATT changes, quote, will reduce visibility into key metrics, unquote, which seems to imply a foregone conclusion. Many users will not want to be tracked if offered the choice. As a result of ATT, quote, app publishers may see a significant impact to their Google ad revenue on iOS, unquote. That's in line with what Facebook said late last year, but without all the commotion. Google says that it has figured out ways to deal with ATT, suggesting that there are ways to deliver ads without tracking users or that Google can circumvent Apple's roadblocks with new tracking features. The following example shows how the prompts will look like. And of course, it's a picture you can't see, but I'll read it to you. And it just says... Pal About, which is the name of this fictitious app, I assume, would like permission to track you across apps and websites owned by other companies. Your data will be used to deliver personalized ads to you. And then there's two choices, allow tracking or ask app not to track. And then back to the article. Only after explaining how advertisers can deal with ATT going forward does Google address the elephant in the room, how we're complying with ATT. Google says that when ATT goes into effect, it won't use information like IDFA, short for Identifier for Advertisers, that falls under ATT for its iPhone and iPad apps that use IDFA tracking for ads. Quote, as such, we will not show the ATT prompt for, on those apps in line with Apple's guidance, unquote. In other words, Google will dump a tracker just so it can avoid having to display a prompt like the one above in its apps, asking for your permission to be tracked. Many people will agree to tracking, and Google's apps certainly deserve to make money from ads. 
but many others won't, and Google is acutely aware of that. Google dropping IDFA doesn't mean the company will stop tracking you, but Google might have other ways that offer tracking without infringing on Apple's new ATT rules. Google also says that it's working with Apple to comply with the new guidelines and that all of its apps will be updated with new features and bug fixes, and that's when the privacy labels will start showing up. Unlike Facebook, Google does make an effort to put privacy first, and the company said in the blog post that it's, quote, committed to preserving a vibrant and open app ecosystem where people can access a broad range of ad-supported content with confidence that their privacy and choices are respected, unquote. Yeah, I don't agree with that last statement at all. All of these companies are making it really hard to stop the tracking. They use dark patterns, which we've talked about on the show before. They hide this stuff. They use euphemisms and euphemistic language to make it sound like it's a good thing that they allow tracking. It's usually couched in language like personalized experience or other things that make it sound, you know, like it's something you want. And you know what? Honestly, if if I felt like they weren't abusing my data on the surface, sure. If you're going to bother showing me an ad, I would like you to show me an ad that I care about and not one that I don't care about. And I'm not against ads. I mean, there are some that are really annoying, but I do understand that that's how companies make money. And if they're not going to charge for their product, they've got to make it somewhere. And they usually do that with advertising. What I do object to is the rampant tracking of our data without proper notice and consent, no matter what they say they're doing. And opting out is just not possible, logistically not possible. There's way, way too many things that are tracking us right now and for us to find every single one of them and turn them off. And by the way, there, it's never a single switch. It's not like there's a track me, not track me. It's if you look at some of the privacy policies on these things and cookies and all, all the various ways to tracking you, they make it really hard. I've seen some of these that have a dozen switches that you have to go through and explicitly turn each one of those things off. That's, that's not a real choice. So anyway, GDPR in the EU, at least you guys have got some, something over there working for you. We're trying to get more of that stuff here in the U.S., uh, and it will come. I Honestly, I believe that we're, we're hitting a turning point, but we're not there yet. So anyway, that's the news of the week. That's a lot to cover. Thanks for hanging in there. Now, I do, <laughs> I've got a tip of the week, but because we've had so much news today, I'm going to keep it kind of simple and put the onus on you. And our tip of the week this week is basically dealer's choice. And here's what I mean by that. This week, I want you to do something, anything that I've recommended to you in the last month. We've had two huge shows and I've had blogs and newsletters on this. We had both the 200th podcast episode where we talked about New Year's resolutions. And not only from me, but from many industry experts, I had a corresponding blog post that gave lots of great ideas for New Year's resolutions, including doing a full network inventory but also referring you back to previous year's lists uh, with tons of individual ideas running the gamut from easy to hard. And then we just had data privacy day last week, uh, again, with a corresponding blog post, newsletter, and in the podcast gave lots and lots of ideas. So pick one, go back, go back, find something in the, in those many lists uh, of ideas of ways to protect your privacy and security as well. Pick one. Maybe pick a big one. Maybe maybe try to take a big chunk out of something that it's, you've just got putting off because it's just too much effort. Go find one of those things, pick it, and put it on your to-do list. Or maybe go for the low-hanging fruit. Maybe there's a lot of little things that you that you really like to get done that you just keep putting off as well. Pick a handful of some of those really quick and easy ones and just knock them out. So again, go to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Look at my recent blog entries on that. You'll find links to all this stuff. Or maybe go back and re-listen to the 200th podcast episode. Whatever floats your boat. Dealer's choice. All right, that's going to be our show today. Thanks again for listening in. A couple quick things before we go. First of all, last call on the listener survey. I've gotten some really great responses. Thank you so much for everybody who's already responded. Uh, we're going to keep it open for just one more week. If you haven't done it already, now is the time to go do that. The link's in the show notes, but again, it's bit.ly slash firewalls dash survey dash 2021. That's bit.ly slash firewalls with a capital F dash survey dash 2021. You don't have to do this, but if you're interested, you can leave me your email address. It's otherwise completely anonymous, but if you want to leave me your email address, uh, I will also be giving away a free PDF copy of my book to a random chosen respondent. Now, I've already got some early results. 
And I'll, I'll give you a little little bit of a sneak peek, and we'll go through these in more detail once I've closed out the survey. But um, some interesting things so far. Uh, first of all, <laughs> the overwhelming respondents have been male. And I don't know if that's because my audience is overwhelmingly male or not, but at least the people choosing to respond so far have been overwhelmingly male. I'm getting listeners from all around the world, which is great. Uh, predominantly the United States, but also Australia, Finland, Ireland, Poland, and the Netherlands. The age range of everybody so far and how long you've been listening to the show uh, run the gamut. They're all over the place, which is great. I've asked, uh, you know, how, what do you think about the length of the show? Uh, and the high runners so far are people either prefer 30 to 45 minutes or 45 to 60 minutes. Most people seem to really like the current balance of news and interviews. We've got a wide mix of users out there in terms of what kind of devices you have, both Apple or Android or Windows or whatever, that's all over the place, which is, again, that's great. And it appears like a lot of you follow me on Twitter, which is wonderful. And I will say that and there's a lot of the, the survey that has some open places where uh, you can actually provide direct feedback. And I'm getting a lot of really great comments there, too. And I promise you, I am reading them all. And that includes the one that you left me, Glenn. Thank you for bringing up your quibbles. And without betraying confidence, I will say that I agree with you on both your points. Now, of course, it's, you know, it's an open survey. I've also gotten a couple trolls in there, which, you know, that's just the nature of the Internet. But I am reading them all. I'm taking them all in. I very much appreciate it and really just want to make this show uh, the best it can be. So uh, I'll do this once a year in January, and this one's getting close to being over. So uh, this is your chance for the rest of this year anyway to give me some direct feedback on the things you like about the show and, you know, and maybe anything you might want to change. Now, I've got some a bunch of interviews coming up. I've got I have three interviews scheduled in the next two weeks alone. Now, of course, that's just recording the interviews, and then I'll be spreading them out in the podcast over the next couple months. And if you want a sneak peek at those, well, you can become a patron on Patreon.com. One of the cool new uh, benefits I'm giving away to my patrons is they are getting sneak peeks at, at who I'm going to be interviewing. And in fact, I'm even going to be opening it up for questions. So you could submit questions. I'll be telling you who I'm going to interview and when, and you can actually submit questions you'd like me to ask them. I've also started publishing the show notes for uh, for the podcast uh, on the weekend prior to the podcast dropping. So if you're a patron, you will get to see what's coming up in the podcast before everybody else does. And you'll conveniently get all the links that I talk about. When I say the links are in the show notes, you will actually get those delivered to you. I will be setting up some sort of a uh, discussion forum with the patrons so you can interact directly with me and even with each other, possibly, if you want. And I've got Tons of other great ideas that I'm batting around uh, and looking for feedback on. So there's actually, a, if you go to patreon.com, uh, you don't have to be a patron to take it. There's a link there on one of the re more recent, um, one of my recent posts that's publicly available to anybody, not just patrons, where you can, there's another survey there if you want to give me some feedback on stuff you'd like to see there. You know, maybe, uh, you know, and all this will be exclusive for my patrons. Obviously, I give away a ton of stuff for free with this podcast and the newsletter and the blog, and I will keep doing that. But I'm trying to find some really cool ways to uh, to go the extra mile and to give some uh, exclusive content for people that for people that are directly supporting my efforts here. You know, maybe some custom product and service reviews, maybe some custom you know how-to videos on topics that you vote for. You know, maybe some extra news segments that I have to cut for time, behind the scenes stuff. You know, I've even thought about something like a I don't know how many how many of you guys are familiar with Cameo. It's really kind of an interesting site where. You could basically contract famous people for varying amounts of money to create custom little videos for you. You know, people do it for birthdays and anniversaries or whatever. You could do whatever you want. And, you know, that's something I'm thinking about offering to patrons. You know, maybe, you know, maybe you've been telling your friends and family, man, you really need to be using a password manager or, man, you've got to stop using the Chrome browser or, you know, you need to switch from Android to iOS, whatever. Maybe hearing that come from somebody else like me, maybe that would make a difference. So anyway, I'm batting around lots of ideas. And if you want to check those out and maybe provide some feedback, you can go to patreon.com and search for Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons uh, and then find the um, find the link to the survey there. All right, that's it. Again, next week, if all goes well, we'll have, a, uh, we'll have an interview uh, set up for next week, probably another two-parter, and plenty more in the hopper coming down after that. Thanks for tuning in. Big thanks again to everybody who's posted reviews for the book and the podcast. Those really, really help. And thanks for all of those who have uh, already turned in their listener surveys. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Get those vaccines as soon as they're available for you. Stay indoors as much as you can. Wear the masks. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> I hate to be, sorry to beat a dead horse. But stay safe out there, everybody. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>